Good evening. How's everyone doing right now? All right. We've got an awesome conversation lined up, but before we start, I wanted to give everybody a sneak preview of what Daryl's been up to with Noggin. So we're going to have a short video. Here's a behind the scenes look at a Noggin original. What's the word? What's the word? What, 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 what's the word? We're going to learn something new that you've never, never heard. What, 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 what's the word? Come on, come on, let's go! Music is a great vehicle, a great medium. The perfect thing to use to educate our young kids, especially little ones. Raise your hand if you like to play and have a friend come over for the whole day. They spill out their toys, you spill out yours. Next thing you know, they're all over the floor. So you cooperate and you clean together. Cause one could clean fast, but two could clean better. Now that you're done, you can say hooray. Guess what you just did? Cooperate. And if we could teach the little ones how to be experts in language and vocabulary and how they communicate with each other, they will grow up to be some very powerful individuals as adults. Amazing, amazing. So, I mean, no matter what you do, you are always totally unapologetically yourself. Yes, you have to be. <laughs> That's the message I want to give all the children, to let them know two things. That's why I did the book, Daryl's Dream. You are perfect just the way you are, and everything about you will allow you to succeed at whatever it is that you want to do. That happened to me. So it don't matter if they want to be doctors, lawyers, teachers, scientists, entertainers. Who they are, what they are, their stories is the thing that will allow them to succeed no matter what obstacles or what adversity they run into. And Alan, you take that same ethos, really, as a social entrepreneur, and you take it down to the level of kids and parents. Can you tell these people what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of an organization called Springboard Collaborative. Uh, parent engagement is the beating heart uh, of what we do. So when I tell the story, I, I always start with my parents. Uh, I'm half Chilean, half Puerto Rican. Uh, in 1973 in Chile, my dad wrote a play in protest of the dictator Pinochet. It was called Libertad, Libertad. Uh, and as you might imagine, Pinochet was not a fan. Uh, my dad was thrown in prison. Uh, he was tortured for years, but luckier than many uh, to make it alive and even luckier to meet my mom. Uh, my mom is from Puerto Rico, youngest of 12, first in her family to go to college. And like so many immigrants, my parents came to the U.S. so that my sister and I could have better educational opportunities. Uh, but pretty quickly, they realized that schools serving poor families like mine often don't live up to America's promise. Uh, so I became a teacher. Uh, I joined Teach for America, became my best attempt uh, at, at a first grade teacher in North Philly. And I was yeah, teaching teachers. in a Puerto Rican neighborhood. I saw myself in my kids, I saw my parents and their parents, and the connection was deeper than just like our, our shared language and culture and experience of childhood poverty. It was the look. My students' parents gazed at their kids with the same unconditional love, unbridled optimism, and unwavering commitment with which my parents gazed at me, right? The same eyes with which my wife and I gazed at our, our nine-month-old daughter, Alma. But I became frustrated that in my classroom, my school, and and our system was treating black and brown par parents like mine as liabilities rather than as assets. And we were talking about a kid's home life as a risk to be mitigated rather than a resource to be cultivated. Knew we were missing a big opportunity. Research shows that parental involvement in their kids' learning is a bigger predictor of academic success than any other variable, including race and socioeconomic status. Uh, and I didn't see a whole lot going on in the education sector to address that. So long story, I founded Springboard a decade ago to close the literacy gap uh, by coaching parents and teachers to team up and help their kids learn to read by fourth grade. Yes! <laughs> There's so much in that, and I'm thinking about all the millions of kids that are on the move now whose educations are disrupted because of these wars and these disasters and how investing in the future is a common thread. Daryl, your media work is also connecting families. And your book, Daryl's Dream, I bought it and uh -huh. had it lying around my house. And my five-year-old picked it up. And she was so drawn in by the art and the images. But she also got the message of inclusion. And I want to know what you think is the connection between the values of inclusion and belonging and these basic skills that kids need to have. Literacy allows the children to experience their stories. They see them, they feel the emotions, they can relate to them. 
when that happens, it gives them an, an, an enthusiasm to learn to educate themselves so they could understand about their environments. Um, for 38 years, I've always, with my music, been inspiring, motivating, and educating while entertaining. People saw the videos, they heard the words, um, they heard the music, the ideas, concepts, and images were something that all children, not just in America, globally could relate to. So my first record, I talked about education and nobody made me do it. It was just because of my experience with my parents, with every teacher, uh, Miss Keenan, Miss Florentino, Miss Regina, Miss Brown, Sister Lucy, I remember all the teachers. So when it was time for me to do my first record at 17 years old, fresh out of high school, my first rap was, I'm DMC, in the place to be. I go to St. John's University. And since kindergarten, I acquired the knowledge. After 12th grade, I went straight to college. So by me talking about kindergarten and school, 12th grades, immediately all the boys and girls could relate to that because every kid understands school. So it's important that the children see themselves, their situations, and their experiences. And especially in this age of mental health, in our worlds, our worlds is our families, our work environments, and our friends, and our relationships. It's the same thing for the kids, but their world is their households, their backyards, their neighborhoods, there's classroom in the schoolyards. So I was like, if people know DMC from high school to St. John's University to walking this way with Aerosmith, in my Adidas to tell the world how tricky it is, maybe Daryl can talk about what was it like when I was in third grade? What was it like in, when, when I was in fifth grade? What was it like when I was growing up? So that the kids can see their environment and their experiences in things that they read so that they will want to understand more. I need to learn those words. I need to learn those concepts. And it's all about education is giving the child the information that will allow them to have the great transformation. I love that. That's a rhyme, that's a rhyme. <laughs> oh yeah, I got that, yeah. So Alejandro, what have you learned in your work with really reaching all these kids about how when parents start to be seen as a resource, what does that do to the culture of school and what does that do to inclusion? Yeah, I think it's a profound shift. Uh, one thing that we were talking about uh, in the, the green room is that kids don't often enough see themselves in their education. They don't often enough see themselves in the books, uh, something that you're tackling. They're not often enough seeing themselves in the curriculum. Uh, and they don't necessarily identify uh, with teachers, uh, given kind of the demographic differences between the, the schools that we come about and, and the, the teaching population. So there's, there's a boundary uh, between home and school and kind of families end up working in isolation to try to help their kids make it and, and help them uh, reach their goals. And teachers work in isolation to, to help kids reach their, their learning goals. And you can just unlock so much of that potential when families and educators work together rather than working in isolation. So during the pandemic, what it's looked like for us in, in districts that struggle to get 20% of parents to show up for a report card conference, we're getting 88% of parents to attend weekly workshops and learn how to be a reading tutor for their kid at home. Say that again. 88%, uh, and that's not even the exciting part. The exciting part is that for every hour that a teacher leads a workshop, parents deliver 25 hours of tutoring at home. Uh, wow. And that creates so much leverage on teachers' time and effort especially critical in a moment when teachers are just so uh, overwhelmed and their capacity is constrained. Uh, and what it means for kids learning is that kids average a three to four month reading gain during each five or 10 week program cycle, closing the gap to grade level uh, by about half in a relatively short amount of time. And families build habits that last. So even six months after one of those short five or 10 week goal setting cycles is over, parents are still coaching their kids in reading for 19 minutes per night more than before the intervention, and 86% of them are still using the instructional strategies that they picked up in the workshops. He's coming at you hard with the data. 
He wants you to know. <laughs> I love me some this data. guy used his data like nobody else I've ever met. And I want to say that I met Alejandro here at this conference a few years ago, and I was so intrigued. I got to go and see Springboard in action, and I met a family, a, 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 a limo driver and a nanny, and they had one daughter, and they lived in the Bronx, and the dad took his limited time off and traveled all the way to the kids' school to go to the workshops and to spend this time and to help her ignite her love of reading. And we have so many kids right now that are, you know, quote unquote behind that need that help to get back on track. And this just really seems like the, the crucial ingredient to fill that need. It's, it's turning the bedtime stories into constant learning time. Yeah. Read, study, um, participate with your children. That's how you empower them. Absolutely. And so where is this going now that we're in the recovery phase? Or do you believe that we're in the recovery phase right now? I think we're in the recovery phase. Uh, what I'm heartened by is I think there, there's been a, a, an overdue awakening in the education sector about the essential role that parents play, parents and families play in their kids' learning at home. Uh, and there's just a, a universal focus on, on COVID learning recovery. Uh, so I'm heartened that there's more conversation uh, uh, around families than, than maybe we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, what I'm worried about is that that conversation about families is over here, and the conversation about learning recovery is over there, right? And, and so there's conversation about what do we do with families, uh, and, and then when it comes to COVID learning recovery, everyone's like scratching their heads trying to figure out, well, where are we going to find an army of tutors, when in reality, families are the tutors that are hiding in plain sight. They're already putting the work in, uh, and we haven't invested in them with the, the resources uh, and the, the uh, uh, kind of tools that they need in order to make the most of their efforts. Uh, so super inefficient families and teachers working on their own, but it turns out that when people work together, they get a lot more done. Yes. Collaboration. Collaboration in education. Heard it here first. Leads to elevation and positive, powerful change. The, the funny thing is um, everybody that brought to Daryl's dream book, so all the parents have been telling me Usually the daughters and their sons and their, their children's book, they get put up on, the, um, up on the shelf in the room for a week. So my book has been up there for like a month right now. And the parents is like, the kids can relate Daryl, they can relate to all the kids in the book, they can relate to all the issues. But the funny thing is that in the back of Daryl's dream, there's a, a page called Daryl's Rap, where, da where I put the Daryl Rap there. So one of the daughters was telling um, the mother and father, they read the book, they've been reading the book to the children for the last month. But the, the, the highlight of the night is the, the parents perform the Daryl's rap. So the father, he's from my generation. So when he performs it, he puts on the glasses and the gold chain and the hat, and he does it. And then when the mother does it, she just reads it. But what's happening right now, the, 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 the kid, the daughters is telling her, there's a mommy. We don't want you to read the rap anymore. Can daddy come do it? Because when daddy does it, he puts on a hat and the glasses and he gets up and he dances around. And the reason why I bring that up is if the parents work with the teachers, you can make education fun. Education should be fun. It shouldn't be in an assignment or a task. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to do with Daryl's dream. And I think there's something on the tables where you can check out the book. There's like a QR code or something. And can you also explain what you're doing with the video series as well? Oh, the, the video series that I'm doing with Nickelodeon and Noggin is called What's the Word? And I know y'all can relate to this. Basically, it's using music to teach children the meaning of words that they normally wouldn't get until they in upper grades. And y'all can relate to this. These children, they gravitate toward the hip hop, right? But the majority of hip hop right now is not good. These kids from kindergarten to third grade will be saying these songs and you'll be driving and you'll hear what's coming out of their mouth and you'll turn around and write, where'd you learn that from? But a lot of times they don't know the meaning of the words that they're saying. So when Nickelodeon and Noggin saw that, they was like, yo, it's easy for a child to learn by using rhyme and rhythm. That's why the ABCs is probably one of the greatest rap songs ever. People forget the ABCs is rhythm and rhyme. A, B, C, D, E, F, 
G. H I J K L M N O P. Q R S T U V. W X Y N Z. So it rhymes. So Noggin was like, yo, let's put the beat, let's put the rhyme with it, and we can teach the words. We can increase a child's vocabulary now because they want to learn. Children are very enthusiastic, they pay attention. So if they can learn these rap songs that are profane and vulgar and so negative, why can't we give them positive, productive music and, um, and use it to educate our children? I love that. So I want to take a minute to talk about something kind of serious because um, I know that we're ready for this conversation and, and we just lived through hopefully a once in a century social catastrophe and uh, our kids are really hurting. There's a mental health crisis with children and teachers and parents and I want to know for you Alejandro, how has that affected how you see your work and your mission and how do we continue with the work of basic skills in that kind of environment? Yeah, it's such a great question. Uh, the focus on learning recovery is pretty narrow on like closing the the disparities that, that have only worsened in, in reading and math. Uh, but to your point, there's a lot more uh, uh, that, that needs to happen in order for, for kids to be whole and, and to be able to reach their, their full potential. Uh, and that's why, even though I get excited uh, about the way that, that parents can accelerate their kids' learning, there's also something intangible, right? Something uniquely joyful about the relationship uh, that families have with their, their children that you can't replicate any other way, right? That there's no smaller classroom than a family's living room, and there's no better way to personalize instruction than through a parent. What could be more personal than, than sharing a book at, at bedtime? Uh, and it also doesn't have to be complicated. The family engagement gets a lot of like, you know, claps when, when you talk about it, but people, super well-intentioned, they don't know what does that look like, what, what is step one, two, and three. Um, so I'll share super briefly, like we, we've been learning about this for the last 10 years and, and we've kind of open sourced the, the method so that anyone and everyone who works with kids, families, educators can, can tackle family engagement in a, in a really practical way. Uh, we call the method Family Educator Learning Accelerators, FILA for short. And there are five 10-week cycles during which parents and teachers team up to help kids reach learning goals. And they've got six basic steps. It's not rocket science. Step one, build a relationship. If you don't have a relationship between families and educators, you don't get far. It can be an in-person home visit, it can be virtual, but you start there. Step two, you measure a baseline. Families and educators need to have a shared understanding of where their kid is in their learning. Step three, set a goal. And that goal has to be winnable in five to 10 weeks. Fewer than five weeks, you don't get a habit. Longer than 10 weeks, and the finish line is just too far away to, to get motivated. Step four, Practice, practice, practice. Kids practice with their educators. They practice with their families at home. The whole team practices together at least four times over the cycle. Step five, measure progress against a goal. And step six, celebrate. Punctuating the experience with a quick win is what crystallizes the lasting habit, both for the educators who realize parents are the co-teachers I never quite knew I had, and for the families who have that transformative experience of setting and achieving a goal with their kid. Uh, that really is the, the secret sauce, uh, and it's something that I would urge anyone in the audience to, to uh, infuse into their work. So you feel like the joy of learning and even the struggle of learning can be part of the healing process? I think it can be, uh, and I, I really think that the, there's no more uh, culturally responsive, scalable, and cost-effective way to, to address COVID learning recovery than to get the people who care about kids most yeah. uh, to work together. And I want to take this to you, Daryl. I mean, you're a person who acknowledges the joy of life and also the pain, the real pain of life. And there's so many kids out there that are going through similar experiences to what you had growing up. How, what is your message for them and what is your hope for them? What I tried to do with Daryl's Dream, the book, for example, um, I, I tell the kids when I speak to them, I speak to them in real time. So a good example is, I've been in show business for 30 years. I still get nervous before I go on stage. I still get scared. I still get afraid. Our children have stress. They have anxiety. They have fear. And they have confusion. 
just like you said, it's important for the families and the people around them to have dialogue. I speak to them about the stuff that I've been through. I speak to them about the stuff that I'm going through. And more importantly, I put it in my music. I put it in the books I write. Five years ago, I started a comic book company called DMC, Daryl Makes Comics. So even when they're looking at the super-powered superhero who is so incredible and powerful, when the superhero is a normal, everyday person trying to make it through life, they see obstacles, they see adversities. They realize that Peter Parker is stressed out too. So if we tell the children the truth, and we put it in the things that they read, the stories that they in the lessons that they learn, they will not only learn that it is possible to overcome adversity and difficulties, like you said, they will create, they will develop the tools through the habits and the repetition of realizing those situations are able to overcome. So talk to them like people, and believe me this, they have answers too. I talk to kindergartens and I go in there to press and then I leave after meeting so kindergartens like I can take on the world. Thank you so much. Guys, what an amazing panel. Thank you guys so much.